testosterone. Today we are going to go in depth with this important hormone. If you want to know the ins and outs of testosterone, then I have a special guest on my show today. Nick is one of my good mates. He's a former pharmacist. He's a current researcher in medicinal chemistry. And we're going to deep dive into the ins and outs of testosterone. This is an in-depth, long-form podcast. So if you want to learn as much as you can about testosterone, stay tuned. Here we go. If you like this content, please like and subscribe. Let's get into it. And here we are today with one of my good mates, Nick. Nick, thanks for coming on board. We'll be talking all about testosterone today. You are a very knowledgeable man on the topic. So, mate, I might just hand it over to you just to uh, explain to our viewers your background and, and why you may potentially know quite a bit about this topic. Okay, yeah. Uh, my name is Nick. Um, I, professionally, I am uh, I'm a former pharmacist. Uh, I have a master's degree in pharmacy. Um, prior to that, I had done um, two bachelor degrees, one in human nutrition, one in uh, health science. Um, I've since done postgraduate uh, diploma in medicinal chemistry as well. Um, worked in the uh, as a pharmacist and in sort of various health clinician roles over the years, um, for many years. Um, since moved on into research, um, where I am now. Uh, personally, I'm... Um, you know, uh, just a gym enthusiast, I guess, one-time competitor, um, forum contributor from many years back. Um, and that's sort of how I've sort of entered into the sort of fitness realms of what's become fitness social media these days. So I tend to sort of float myself in the background. Um, don't like to sort of become too personally attached and personally involved in anything, but um, have to sort of throw my uh, you know, uh, somewhat vetted knowledge into um, into the sphere when 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 it's uh, when my friends ask me to. <laughs> man, the man with the biggest biceps, you got a, a cracker of a physique, mate, and, and you're a lifetime trainer. You really are. So look, we're, we're today we're going to talk about uh, testosterone. Is it is it the king of hormones for males? Can you can you sort of just give us a bit of a breakdown about testosterone? Like, uh, what's its role in the body in particular with males and um, just to give our viewers some understanding of, of potentially the importance when it comes to building muscle, um, but specifically, what role does testosterone play in the body? Yeah, so uh, that's probably uh, an age-dependent thing that seems to take on um, take on various different primary and secondary and tertiary roles in in the whole age spectrum. So, um, you know, obviously, when it starts surging during puberty, um, it's primarily involved in the development of your secondary male uh, characteristics. So they're the things like deepening your voice, you know, hair growth, um, bone growth, muscle growth, all the things that generally are characterized as masculine these days, the, um, the, the androgenic type activity, meaning uh, that the testosterone itself is acting like a sex hormone and in, in, in so far as acting on uh, tissues in a sense where it's signaling very specific processes in those tissues to um to undergo those changes. So for instance, in the larynx, like when you, we just mentioned deepening of the voice, that that's involved with some structural changes to the larynx, the voice box. So that's, you know, in sort of puberty, um, during uh, sort of, uh, you know, late adolescence, adult phase, it's um, adult to, to beginning of, sort of later ages it's um it's it's primarily involved in things like your bone health um your muscle uh maintenance muscle um, cell and muscle development um and obviously ongoing sex characteristic development um so uh that so in there is some sort of secondary roles in cardiovascular health as well um neurological health um so things like um, uh, your cognitive function, so brain function type things. This is very broadly speaking. Um, and then moving into later age, it, um, uh, it's, it's sort of the, the later sort of decline into sort of older age. It's um, all those things that are more sort of um, adapted for a maintenance type thing. So it's, it's basically doing all the you, you want it to be doing all the anabolic things with a little bit less of the androgenic things going into later age, depending on your health, of course. So um, that's probably the most broadest broadest way we could sort of characterize that. Um, if we're looking at it specifically um, for 
muscle development, which is, um, you know, its biological role in insofar as males and and in females to some degree. Um, over the adult life, well, just just on that one thing, Nick, is it is it yep. true that males have about ten times more testosterone naturally than females, just as an average? Like, is that the rough ratio? And, and as an average, it's probably around there. Like, um, f- females are like in the um, we're talking single nanomole per liter to sub single nanomole per liter, um, and and males we're sort of um, this this is the serum concentration range. So. Um, and that's that's an average con- concentration range as well. We can we can get into the specifics of that, like as a, a average versus you know like a, versus like a diurnal pattern that we where you get ups and downs of it. And then with males um, for their their concentration range, um, the it tends to be a moving target, and depending on the um, on the laboratory method used to analyze the testosterone concentration in your blood. So. That's the way that they basically take your blood and measure it in there. Um, the normal ranges t- uh, can start at sort of the low end is um, somewhere close to sort of 10.8 to 11 nanomole per litre. Upwards and the high end is upwards of 28, I think, uh, 28 to 29. It tends to be, as I said, it's a moving target. And that's based on uh, mass spectrometry um, measurements where in Australia, most of our labs use, if you'll go to get a blood test, most of our labs use um an immunoassay method, uh, method, which is a little bit less uh, discriminant in terms of being identified those sure. range. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah. in essence, yeah, it's around about 10 times a month. It can be more. And obviously, that's an average measure. So, yeah. 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 Nice. And, and look, you touched on um, its potential anabolic effects or, or um, helping with muscle growth. So, let's chat about that for a second. I guess, um, you know, it, it can be seen as the gold standard in bodybuilding in the bodybuilding world as you know you need high testosterone to grow lots of muscle um can you talk about that um, uh, is it true that there's a couple of mechanisms one is that uh, we're increasing muscle protein synthesis testosterone helps with that but also in terms of satellite cell activation especially uh, for some of our viewers that you know these might be new concepts can you explain that as simply as possible yeah i can do my best mate um uh so yeah, it, it's it's true that um, this, uh, the testosterone is involved with muscle cell development and, mu- and muscle muscle fiber development. Um, so, in terms of like uh, stimulating and achieving protein synthesis um, in the muscle cell, testosterone does have a large or the testosterone. Uh, T- uh, biological targets in the body, meaning that where it goes to in the body when it's secreted, um, is primarily like the you've got your your sex hormone glands, meaning your testes and and your um, your uh, nipples, things like that. Um, then you then you've also got your your muscle, and your muscle is a rich uh, sort of uh, tissue of testosterone receptors. So when testosterone is secreted a large amount of it will be taken up by the the muscle cell so in inside the muscle cell um the testosterone will bind to the testosterone receptor it will uh it which is inside the cytoplasm so of the cell like it's gone it's bound traveled through the cell into the muscle cell inside the muscle cell there's a testosterone receptor when that gets activated the receptor gets activated um the receptor changes shape recruit something called co-activators and co-repressors, then it travels into the nucleus where it is involved in gene transcription. So that's basically uh, signaling or active, activating of genes in order to turn on uh, and, and create an mRNA, which is a messenger RNA signal, which will then go to the ribosomes and then create a protein. So there's quite a number of proteins. It's very, it's very hard to categorize any one particular protein that testosterone um, will uh, predominantly affect because it's different in different tissues. So, um, so in terms of like affecting protein synthesis itself in the muscle, like so creating new muscle cells, it might do this as a primary action where it might actually induce, you know, the uh, the translocation of uh, the the um, induction of like specific uh, transporters to bring in amino acids into the cell. It might do that. Um, at some degree, it might um, go in and produce a protein called folistatin that um, might reduce the 
uh, amount of myostatin, which is a specific gene repressor um, in, inside the muscle, which in turn will allow protein synthesis and hypertrophy to occur at an a increased um, rate. Um, sorry, this is really complex, but uh, this is in terms of protein synthesis, this is the this is probably the nuts and bolts of it. Um, broadly, um, sort of only at a stage now in research where we can do something called the um, a proteome study or a me metabolome study. And what that does is essentially it will, um, you'll, they'll take a muscle cell, they'll feed it testosterone, and they'll just see which proteins are produced by the ribosomes afterwards. Then you can categorize what those proteins do. So in terms of like saying, yes, it does increase protein synthesis, we can say that we can say that as a matter of fact, because we can specifically test that. How it does that specifically is a matter of sort of very uh, nano micro uh, sure, sort of sure, yeah, quite yeah. complex. Yeah. So, yeah, so yeah. long story short, the testosterone uh, is it binds with the androgen receptors that then moves to is it the the DNA, which then affects yeah. protein transcription. Like essentially, is that like a very that, that's, broad? That's that's it in the most broadest terms. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. it'll create that that mRNA, which is the 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 code for the protein, and then the code then will go into the ribos ribosomes and do that. So, yeah. And then when it comes to uh, potential satellite cell activation can you just give a, a a brief sort of breakdown of what the satellite cells are and, and yeah. are, are they essentially like muscle stem cells yeah more or less so they they sit in something called the basal lamina which is like a sort of an area uh, outside of the muscle cell um it's kind of like a little repository of those types of um those types of cells that can be differentiated, they're called progenitor cells. Progenitor cells can essentially turn into something else. So they're, they're immature and they can, they, can, um, they can go in and then a satellite cell itself in the most broadest terms for so muscle, muscle uh, sort of specific tissue, it can be involved in repair um, of, of the muscle cell itself. So <clears throat> the, the way in which testosterone um, sort of activates those is, is a little probably even more complicated than, than the protein synthesis specifics itself. But what it's it's hard to infer from, from what we understand of the research, it's hard to infer that um, we're going to be doing that to any appreciable degree without some sort of super physiological stimulus, meaning that um, if we're like, for instance, we're training, we're doing some excessive, um, you know, not excessive resistance training, what, what the, the lay population would call excessive, the, what most people undertake, um, uh, th then you're going to get that stimulation. It's going to come through uh, uh, testosterone signaling as well as other signaling. But where it seems to be most applicable is in sort of the super physiological range of, of testosterone um, serum concentration. So when we're looking at... Um, uh, you know, animal studies where they've, you know, used very high levels or there's a very, you know, the, or the in vitro studies where they've used like isolated muscle cells and use very high levels of testosterone and then observed the satellite cell activity that way in terms of like stimulating the satellite cell activity. So what it does at a um, sort of um, normophysiological level, meaning the, the amount that both you and I are producing it right now, or maybe 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 we're somewhat in the um, in the deficient being, being sort of plus forty not. ourselves. So um, <laughs> what it does for us is is um, you know it's probably occurring at sort of a basal level, like meaning that it's not really it's not really largely a um, largely a testosterone concentration driven process. I hope that sure. makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, and and so then I guess uh, would it be right like the the muscle cells have a, a unique ability for multiple nucleides, myonuclei ability, and that is involved in the the transcription of proteins, and and so is it is it fair to say that if um, that testosterone can along with resistance training it can increase the myonuclei ability of muscle cells? Would that be right? That, that's that's what it seems to do. Um, it's uh it's it's. It's more or less been that 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 factor is more or less only been um, somewhat established in more recent times. So it was it was a it was a theory and it was observed in vitro, meaning it was observed outside of, in outside of the body's studies. Um, and yeah, it's it seems uh, something called cell splitting, where where it's forced the cell to basically 
divide itself. Uh, muscle cells weren't thought to do that, or they or it's duplicated its nucleus, meaning it's got a second nucleus inside the muscle cell, which is um, where, where it becomes multinucleated or, or, or myonuclei uh, increased. Um, so in that sense, um, there was only a recent paper um, published, it was this year, that, um, that looked at, uh, it was looking at for the purposes of, if I remember correctly, it was looking at purposes for um, uh, assessing people who had athletes who engaged in doping in the past to see if they still had uh, an advantage um, from using a testosterone preparation, as, as I mentioned before, the, the, that type of activity, that type of sweating will only occur sort of in super physiological, you know, doping senses. And, and they found that, you know, it was long after the, the these athletes had even ceased any of their athletic activity, whatever their sport was, that there was still retained those, um, you know, uh, increased myonuclei per square volume of, um, of, of muscle tissue, which, um, which is really interesting. So it seems to be like somewhat of a permanent, permanent fixture. Once, once that myonuclear has, um, has split. Yeah. So then just thinking about that, and, and I guess there's a lot of controversy in tested sport at the moment, um, you know, with biological males trying to compete against biological females as trans women. So if an individual born a male and they've gone through puberty um, and maybe they've, they've trained in that sport and they've been active, um, even if they then transition to being, say, a, a trans female, they potentially still have a very fair, unfair advantage due to their previous exposure to testosterone. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, it's it's a pretty touchy subject, that one, like in terms of like the, the controversy associated. But as I said before, like if we're looking specifically at that self splitting or the um the my uh, the the increase in the um in the myonuclei inside per, per square volume of muscle then you know um comparing males and females um you know at what would you know be a physiological level of testosterone not not only is like the the male sort of um uh pubertal phase involved in you know the increased muscle cells uh, muscle volume and muscle size muscle function bone strength then there, there might be that observed like you know you'd, you'd pretty much have to have a look at sort of um the standardization of um of of that through puberty and through adult life or just soon after puberty would be ceased uh, or puberty is finished to be able to assess that um, objectively, but you're essentially making some extrapolations still there, like to to assume that that those mo multinucleated cells that might have become multinucleated as a result of a male puberty, male sex hormone puberty, um, are performance enhancing as well. So, like that 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 needs to be established as well. Like we can understand sure. that, yeah, you, you, we can understand that it's going to per per uh, just having more nuclei per, you know, uh, volume of muscle is going to create more protein. It's going to have more cell volume and more uh, functional capacity as a result of it. But um, we're we're still only inferring that. And, you, and the way that sort of <laughs> the way that this uh, doping and and every and uh, and you know transgender. Uh, sort of research and application to you know sports is in 2024 it really needs something extremely objective like a yes or no yeah. answer in, in that sort of yeah. and so, something that's, so that's, that's absolute yeah yeah exactly exactly so i yeah. mean like you, you and i can you and i can pick that apart and just make that inference and then you know make our own opinions on that but how it applies formally is um is, is a matter sure, of sure. Well, yeah. I guess then uh, taking another look at um, maybe a, a different perspective, what about someone who has, say, previously trained, let's just say a male, and they've been training through their 20s and they put on a lot of muscle mass and then they take a break from the gym um, and then they come back to training later in life, they potentially have that muscle memory phenomena, don't they? And and uh, they can potentially put on a very large amount of lean muscle mass in a, in a pretty freaky uh, period of time because of the adaptation that they've previously made to the, the training stimulus. Is that correct? Yeah, that's, that's right. Yeah. And that, and that goes, um, that goes well beyond like just the hormonal things. So like the, just the, the influence of testosterone, there's, 
all sorts of um, uh, biochemistry and and functional uh, functional and uh, biochemical anatomy that's that's involved. They're very complex things like your um, you know your uh, neuromuscular efficiency. Um, you know the all, all those types of all, all those types of um, uh, influences to um, to to building muscle and hypertrophy. Um, there, there seems to be quite a number of those that are preserved, and um, and it's, it's fascinating. Um, so I don't think we could chalk it up only to um, increase muscle cell nuclei. Um, I think there's there's yep. a bunch of other things there as well. Yeah. yeah. Sure. Sure. Well, talking about that, I guess uh, neurological adaptations, neural drive. I have read uh, in a few different places, and I, I really wanted to get your opinion on this. If testosterone levels become elevated, do you see a very quick increase in neural drive? So in terms this, of this really how, how strong you are in the gym, how much weight you can lift, maximum force production, does that increase, you know, quite rapidly when testosterone levels rise? Yeah, so it's we, we have to sort of make some some extrapolations from what like as I, I as I said, but, but or, no, I didn't say, but uh, I'm. I look at things from a pharmacological perspective, like that's my education. So, um, so when I when I when I assess something, I'll, I'll run it through that sphere of um, of basically reverse engineering a um, a sort of uh, pharma pharmacological trial, if you will. So from from beginning to end. So um, there is some data. It's not necessarily complete in terms of like uh, the androgens. In general, so that's testosterone and all the analogs, and whether you know you've got all metabolites. So that's things like your your DHT and then your um, downstream metabolites from those. Um, how they influence uh, a different sort of signaling pathway of testosterone, um, where where there can be increased sort of um, uh, neural activity. So it's that. There seems to be like what's called a, a non-genomic pathway of, of testosterone signaling, meaning that it doesn't necessarily go through the DNA as we previously ex- described. The it still might go through a uh, DNA, uh, uh, what's called a nuclear receptor, even though it's not co it doesn't go into the nucleus to do its job, and that might increase things like your um, calcium ion movement inside the muscle cell, which can increase things like your uh, neural responsiveness of that muscle cell. There's also another um, extracellular testosterone receptor. Um, that one's called, I believe it's it's changed names. I think currently it's called the megalin receptor. Um, and it's basically, it's ligand. So what fits into it is into that receptor that causes like a, a downstream activation in the sense from a cell membrane, meaning that it's that's the when you've got your cell present in your body, that's the one that's most available to the blood because it's the most outermost receptors. Like so the testosterone receptors inside the muscle cell. And because testosterone is like a cholesterol molecule, it can travel inside and outside, transverse the cell membrane, which is like a fat, fatty lipid layer. Um, this one when um when it's bound to uh, sex hormone binding globulin, um it it forms this complex that can actually bind onto this megalin receptor and cause uh, a, a type of cascade like it's like a immediate type response cascade because uh, steroid hormone receptors they 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 don't produce necessarily produce when they go into the DNA and cause that transcription, that's a slower process. So like we're talking like hours to days to weeks to months of like them producing the outcomes that are going to come from that. When you've got like something like a G protein coupled receptor, which I'm pretty sure that the megalin is, um, they're cell, cell membrane bound receptors. They tend to have responses that are significantly more rapid. So they're things like, like your stimulants, for instance, like you take a stimulant, mm-hmm. you feel it. You know that they they bind on on receptors that are on the outside, so that their response is a little bit quicker. Now, with um with this megalin receptor that seems to um seems to uh its main ligand seems to be uh, testosterone bound to SHBG. I think also estrogen or estradiol bound to SHBG might actually activate this receptor as well. Um, that that response in terms of like what it can do at the muscle cell also seems to increase the 
you know, the the things like your neural drive and things like that. So yeah, it's 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 complex. Like there seems to be it seems to be multifactorial. But um, but yeah, you're right in in terms of like uh the, the available testosterone at that particular time or androgen at that particular time will um does seem to have that that effect. So it does seem to have that effect of increasing your drive. I'll just and I guess that's why um that's right. Yeah. I guess if you sort of like put all that out, we're talking about, you know, the increased potential uh, muscle mass, potentially some increases in, in your strength. And I guess this is why it is such a performance enhancing drug, isn't it? That it, you know, it can improve your performance dramatically, especially if you go above and beyond, you know, natural levels. And um, if we think about then, you know, testosterone, I guess uh, a lot of people will just think about its production from your testes, but uh, a lot of people might not realize that the brain is heavily involved in the production of testosterone and regulating hormones in general so there's what's known as the hpta uh made it uh, uh, would it be possible to get a simple answer about this because i know it's a very complex yeah. uh you know yeah. subject and to be honest i've i've often been confused about you know the different um signaling in the brain so first up what is the hpta and how does it affect testosterone production yeah so it's it's an axis meaning that it's like sort of two points that sort of connect and then there's interconnecting points between those. Um, it's called the hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis. So um, basically inside your brain, well, to the lower sort of mid section of it, um, sort of towards, it's probably, if you feel the back of your neck, it's probably sitting, you know, a finger's length deep at the back of your neck. You've got your pituitary, which is kind of like a, it's kind of like a reg master regulator of hormones. And then above your pituitary, um, you've got a thalamus and then above that you've got the hypothalamus yes and that and then so the the hypothalamus itself receives input from your body of hormones that transverse or um different biological molecules that transverse your blood brain barrier and bind into it and it's kind of like the feedback the sort of um it's sort of like the control center that says yeah we've got too much of this we've got too little of that and then it produces yep affect the molecules that will then go down into the pituitary. Um, one of those for testosterone being a uh, gonadotrophin releasing hormone. Um, and when it, when that binds into the pituitary, um, it'll signal the production of luteinizing hormone and some follicle stimulating hormone. So luteinizing hormone is um, in, in the true sense of the word of what luteinizing means, it, it will, it will basically travel from the hypothalamus, uh, sorry, from the pituitary, to the testes, to the, um, not the Sotoli cell, the Leydig cells of the testes and um, where, where it stimulates the production of testosterone. And then testosterone itself will travel the, the body, get metabolized um, inside the testes, in peripheral tissues like your fat cells, in other um, en endocrine glands like your liver um, and, and your brain. And eventually, your your body sort of will regulate the amount of testosterone produced by how much goes back into the hypothalamus. So it's like the it's feedback. Like essentially, it's like a feedback loop, isn't it? Depending yeah. Yeah, on whether it's, like it's a, a negative or positive sort of feedback. Yeah. 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 So if, if there's yeah. uh, if high testosterone is um, is detected from the hypothalamus, um, that would then indicate that testosterone levels are high, which would affect the downstream signaling, and it would mean that there would be lower signaling for testosterone production. Would that be right to regulate your that's, testosterone? That's right. Yeah, you'll you'll get lower LH. So, and this this happens in a diurnal rhythm. Like so, in the in the male um, that's you know not using any um, testosterone replacement or using um, anabolic steroids, uh, the um, It'll happen in a diurnal pattern. So like that signaling is sort of micromanaged continuously. So when you wake in the morning, you'll get an you'll get your first LH surge and then you might get one sort of slower in the afternoon. So that's, you know, when, when you go and get a testosterone blood test, you, you tr your, the idea is to get the highest possible blood uh, concentration of that day. So that is always going to be the highest. It's going to sort of fluctuate up and down. But that that there is indicative of that point in time only. So you know, if you got one later in the afternoon, you know, you might see a slight change or maybe a dramatic change. But but those patterns of those of that hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis, they're continuous. So there there's no sort of there's no sort of one system where it's going feeding back 
immediately and then regulating, keeping your testosterone at a, at a very stable level, it's constantly fluxing, just like anything else yep. in your body. Yeah. And, and so, uh, again, if your testosterone levels are high, that can cause negative feedback where your body will actually lower its testosterone production. But um, I know estrogen has a role too. So how does that um, how does that affect the negative feedback loop? Like if you have higher estrogen levels or lower estrogen levels, it can affect testosterone production overall? Yeah, yeah. It's very much similar way to testosterone. I mean, in males, um, estrogen itself is as uh, it's sort of observed, well, not observed by the body, regulated by the body insofar as that it's a metabolite of, estrogen, uh, of testosterone. So where there is elevated estrogen, um, in a healthy individual, um, then there probably will have been an increased testosterone production at some point. So it's even if there wasn't an increased testosterone production at some point. So that like that phenomena, well, it's not really phenomena, it's pretty well understood now, is that um is probably most sort of observable in obese patients where they've obese males where they've got a large repository of adipose tissue so when they do produce testosterone that that adipose tissue is a primary metabolic site for testosterone to be converted into um into estrogen so um and so yeah, if, they, so if, they, if their brain thinks that they have or they have higher estrogen levels then their brain can think that they have therefore higher testosterone levels which will then reduce the downstream production of testosterone in effect yeah is that right yeah 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 yeah, nice, nice. And so well, I guess then that that's the, the one thing that a lot of people don't consider if they were to use um, anabolic steroids, if they were to use exogenous testosterone, it is going to have a detrimental effect on the HPTA and, and it will essentially shut down your natural production of testosterone, won't it? Yeah, yeah, that's, it's inevitably going to do that. Um, depending... There is some nuance to that. There is some nuance. So, um, so if we're looking specifically at testosterone uh, replacement, um, there, there is a dose dependent sort of uh, effect depending on the formulation and the administration route. So, if you're looking at something like an injection, where you're going to have a, you know, the the pharmacokinetic, so meaning the way that you're body deals with the drug and how long it stays in your body as a result of the way that your your um, body deals with the drug, you're going to get a, a very steady level. So we think back to where I was talking about those diurnal rhythms where they're going up and down. When you have an injection, the basic premise behind using something like a testosterone enanthate or an undecanoate or something like that um, is to um, sort of stabilize your testosterone levels via the manipulation of the formulation of that testosterone. So um, that they add a for the for the testosterone uh, enanthate, which is not really used in Australia anymore. We used to use it as a prima testin. Um, uh, it's it's been pulled from PBS guidelines. Um, uh, the undecanoate is, but um, but both of those basically they have like a long fatty ester chain attached to the 17 beta hydroxy position of testosterone. In short, basically uh, it's something that manipulates the way that the testosterone, when it's injected in your body, releases from what's called a depot, like, like a bus depot where all the buses go and stop. It, go, it forms depot in your muscle cell, then it's slowly released out of there. So what you get in effect, where I was going with this, is you get a, a more stable level. So what that looks like in your body is completely different. Say your say your uh, your um, con testosterone concentration on replacement is managed at twenty five nanomole per liter, and you you go and find somebody who has twenty five nanomole per liter um, in uh, in their blood concentration naturally. That seems to be around about their average measure. It looks different in the body. Like it's different. It, it will act different in the body because that twenty five um, uh, nanomole per liter is what's called a steady state concentration. It's always there. So it might go higher immediately after the injection because you might just get like a, a the acute phase bolus dose will go through um, lymphatic lymphatic absorption. It's irrelevant anyway, but you can get a, a sort of small spike which will taper off sort of slowly over a couple of days. But where it sort of settles as an average is as an average over 15 days rather than as an average over one day 
is um is higher mm-hmm. than where it would well not not necessarily higher but it's more stable where it was so so what you get there where i'm going with this in in, in relation to the hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis is you get a more steady signal at the hypothalamus saying that this is the testosterone level it's not going up and down it's that's what it is so you're going to get a a shutdown in lh now there is other formulations of testosterone replacement um that don't seem to do it as much but they seem to have their um uh sort of pharmacokinetics so their release characteristics from their formulation are more acute meaning that they will like for instance a testo gel a testosterone gel formulation with which is just basically a testosterone without a ester free testosterone um ethanol and uh and a thickener thickening agent um they, that's rubbed on the skin and it absorbs relatively rapidly out of the skin it's got a pretty rapid pharmacokinetic profile in terms of like the absorption and elimination um and it's uh and it can get somewhat metabolized in the skin cells but that's sort of in a sort of nuanced area but you you have to apply those daily so you'll get a more a peak and then a trough slowly off during the day then you get a peak and slowly off during the day rather than a than the steady level like you get with the injection and then that seems to at, at sort of lo- lower doses and this is really idiosyncratic so this meaning that it's peculiar to the individual so like you know things like your know, adipose tissue levels and things like that will will vary the amount of shutdown that you'll get from this you'll invariably get some shutdown but that as i said that's unique to the individual but it seems to be less than it would would be and more rapidly reversible upon cessation than than an injection is now there's a another another testosterone preparation that has even more acute uh, uh release properties than does a gel and that's a nasal spray one um, it's called Nate Testo. It's uh, yep. recently been re- recently approved, and that one that will give you a really quick spike in testosterone with a relatively slow elimination rate, um, quicker than the, the gels, and that that in itself will um, doesn't shut down anywhere near as much. Like it'll bring you down. I think the average range was dropping from uh, seven units per liter, uh, seven units of um, luteinizing hormone per liter to um 3.5 so it's halved whereas with a testosterone undecanoate that's after 12 weeks uh, and uh, with an undec uh, testosterone undecanoate so the reandrin although there's a lot of um uh generic brands of it now um many of them so the reandrin's probably not even made anymore because there's you can buy a cheaper brand you can buy a cheaper brand if you own a pharmacy that's what you do um and uh and that that one itself will um the, that will like can eliminate your luteinizing hormones to almost almost undetectable levels. So that's okay. that's the difference. So, and yeah. what it seems to be, I don't know. I've seen quite a bit on YouTube, a few videos, and, and also uh, just talking to people in the gym. You know, there seems to be in the past few years, like a lot of people taking exogenous testosterone that feel they need to microdose it every day. Um, you know, doing s- subcutaneous injections, uh, like. Yeah, is that is that just I guess bro talk down the gym? Like you know what what you're talking about here? Levels do stabilize, especially if you're running a hormone or testosterone replacement therapy dose, maybe once a week or something like that. You know, microdosing is that is that just dudes talking down the gym and thinking they're going to get a better result? Or so um, I'll preface this by saying that um, uh, testosterone replacement in Australia needs to be initiated by an endocrinologist, urologist, or a pediatrician. That that has to happen. So um, so the the yeah. the micro nuances of these sorts of administration frequencies and things like that should be managed by a qualified, insured, registered healthcare professional. That's the most important thing. There is yeah. a, a re, a unusual emergence of an underground testosterone replacement sort of halt um, that seems to operate in rather gray terms. I'm not going to say much more about it than that because I don't want to get myself into any trouble. And, I, and sure. I've only just I've only engaged as an observer only just to see this. And I think this is where this microdosing um, protocol has um, emerged. Now, in terms of what it's what what it sort of entails, so that's that's with all that sort of preface out of the way. So. Um, we're assuming, and that- I guess look, I guess the reason I asked Nick is, oh, sorry, I wasn't yeah. putting you on the spot. It, it was more yeah. that it, it seems silly. It seems like you know, guys are taking a 
bit more of a risk because every time you're injecting something into mm. your body, you're you're breaking the yeah. skin barrier. There's chances of infection. Yeah. There's chances things go wrong. It just seemed like yeah. there was a lot of misinformation. Yeah. So, um, so in terms of like, um, so let's just imagine that this this person who we're talking about now is a person, and that they have been prescribed a let's call it a primatestin, um, because for whatever reason, testosterone undecanoate, they're allergic to it, and people or something in it. So they had to, they've gone through the special access scheme because we're not allowed to sell it anymore in Australia. The endocrinologist, sorry for this preface, we just have to put this in here. The endocrinologist sure. has engaged with the person. They've been trained by a nurse on how to administer the medicine. Um, they've discussed this um, uh, adjusted um, frequency uh, protocol with their treating physician being the endocrinologist or the urologist or whomever it is there is some sort of um there is some credence to reducing the frequency in so far as to manipulate the amount that's available at any one time by the body for metabolism so what I, when i mean metabolism i mean the two primary sites are um aromatase to estradiol um, or 5 alpha reductase isoforms to dihydrotestosterone. Now, they, they occur, generally occur at the tissue level, but they can also occur at the tissue level and then affect the uh, serum level. So what you're doing by injecting frequently this particular patient, they, they would be reducing the bolus amount that becomes available immediately after injection thereby stabilizing their blood levels to a to a point whereby there would be less peaks and less troughs in in between injections so by doing that you'll you will still you'll reach what's called steady state concentration now jet steady state concentration is generally achieved for most drugs as a rule of thumb after four to five half lives now a, a half life of this particular patient who's getting special access scheme, primatestin, testosterone, and amphate, this uh, that that would be sort of fifty days. Let's call it fifty days with an uh, eight to sort of ten day half life. So that they that that's when they would reach steady state concentration, meaning that the the amount that's in their blood between their intervals should be stable, depending on the frequency of the injections. So giving him more frequent injections of smaller doses will mean that he will not go up and down in between that before he reaches that steady state concentration. So his blood levels where he's doing these micro doses by average across the middle there will be more stable than if he's done one, then two, then you take the average of that. So, so, so yeah, that, if that's, you that's, were this on, oh, sorry, if you were getting this on script, uh, why wouldn't you then opt for the cream on script then? Would that is it because it's too it's too fast in and out during the day? Yeah, look, um, I th look, um, I, I could probably, uh, from observation of like anecdote, like so that's me either dispensing the medicines in a pharmacy or observing this as an outside anonymous observer observing this cult like behavior. People seem to associate, um, you know, the potency of a drug with the administration route, I guess. So, like, you know, seeing as an injection is somewhat more taboo. And as you brought up before, like, there, there is that um, risk of infection um, when, when, you're, when you're injecting that frequency and then frequently. And then there's, there's other things that should be considered, like um, people who are on anticoagulants or on specific blood platelet modifying drugs, you know, like low dose aspirin and things like that, they can be at risk of like hematoma, um, you know, like a, a bleed, a micro bleed and things like that. And, you know, they're, they're you know, when, when someone's got like a uh, predisposition to sort of, you know, cardiovascular disease or something like that, they're, they're risks that probably should be weighed into that, that particular sort of um, schema. And probably the reason why this sort of hasn't necessarily been adopted by formal medical orthodoxy um you know like i can see that you know if i look at overseas um replacement clinics where there's a little little less stringent guide uh laws than there is in australia um you can see where like you know genuine um 
prescribing physicians um, who are working within their scope, which is different to what we have here in Australia, they can prescribe these sorts of protocols of microdosing where um, where it's it's you know there's there's some degree of their oversight um, a little bit more, so they can then sort of discriminate sure. a little bit more. Where where in Australia. We, we might have somebody who's completely unqualified vetting the patients uh, um, and, and doesn't even consider those things, wouldn't even understand the drugs that they're on if they dictated them to them. So, yeah. And in Australia as well, you, you almost have to have non-existent testosterone production as a male to be able to get any yeah. testosterone on script. Is that right? Like the, the, the yeah, cutoff right. is, is ridiculously low. Yeah, so I think for um, 40 to 65 years, I think it's 6.1 via mass spec. 6.1 nanomole per litre by mass spec. Um, this is according to the latest therapeutic guidelines. So the therapeutic guidelines are kind of like the guiding principles consolidated for any sort of GP, endocrinologist, any sort of specialist, any consult, anyone who prescribes a medicine except for a dentist. Um, uh, even nurse practitioners use the therapeutic guidelines. Um, so, yeah, 6.1. And that has to be uh, functionally. Uh, not non-functionally so functional testosterone deficiency is different from pathological testosterone deficiency so functional testosterone deficiency can come from things like anabolic steroid abuse um, opioid abuse um, obesity um, corticosteroid use so like things like your um, prednisolones and things like that that people might be on so um, they uh, even from um, uh, like a, a poor sleep hygiene as a result of like shift work that that can produce functional testosterone deficiency and that that's um that's very important because uh assessing someone off their blood test alone and the the criteria for the blood test to meet pbs criteria so pbs criteria is is sort of different to the therapeutic guidelines but they sort of run parallel anyway they, they tend to be the same is is um you need to be 40 years old or older and this is to meet pbs so pbs me pbs criteria means even though the testosterone itself is very cheap, and when you buy it from the pharmacy, it's cheap, it's under what's called the co-payment, meaning that that's the maximum amount a drug can cost before the government would chip in the, the, the rest of it. So if the drug was $50, the maximum amount, I think it's $30.80 or something like that now. So the government would, if you, you'd only pay $30.80, the government would chip in the rest. So that's that's the that's sort of the, the way that sort of drugs are, one of the gauges of the, suitability for a drug to be added to the PBS, the pharmaceutical benefit scheme inside of Australia. Um, so the PBS criteria is essentially the safest method for a physician, which in this case would be an endocrinologist, pediatrician, a urologist, for prescribing testosterone in terms of being compliant with the guidelines. So the patient has to be, so in terms of androgen deficiency, so what we're talking about, so that. We're not talking about things like congenital uh, disorders or, you know, um, uh, things like uh, test orchectomies, like where you've had to have your testicles removed, or um, or things like uh, pu uh, uh, delayed puberty in males, you know, or micropenis is another one. So um, they're, they're all sort of separate criteria, but they all fit under Medicare authority guidelines, meaning that. When the it say the patient is presented to the GP, the GP's done the test. They've said, "Oh shit, your uh, testosterone levels are low." Um, we'll repeat that test, and just so we can we can meet the guidelines, so because you, you need two specific tests that'll show um, sub six point one nanomole per liter. If you're um, well, you got to be over forty, but um, if if that's if you're between forty and sixty five. And then, then they would then refer you on to the endocrinologist, and then the endocrinologist would assess you. They might do um, imaging. They might look for a prolactinoma, a type of thing that would be a pathological, meaning pathology, meaning disease. So they'd look for a pathological cause of, of whatever's, um, whatever's causing the deficiency. Um, and then they would treat accordingly after that. So if it's a prolactinoma in, uh, you know, and it's, and it's causing, it's secondary to say a seminoma, which is like a test, testicular cancer, you definitely don't want to be on testosterone replacement, um, you know, and they might pick up that that seminoma is secondary, this is going way out there, but might be secondary to a prostate cancer, you know, like, and these are all the things that should be assessed by a qualified specialist, not just your GP. So that's the reason why these sorts of um, uh, hurdles are in place for somebody like 
you and I to go, I want to go on testosterone replacement therapy. Why won't my GP do it? You know, they, these are all the types of things that the hurdles that they need to jump through. So the PBS criteria, essentially the endocrinologist will ring up Medicare, explain the the criteria that they've met specifically, they'll get themselves an authority number. The authority number goes on the prescription. The prescription then gets given to the patient. The patient goes to the pharmacy. The pharmacy fills it, enters in the authority number, gets re-registered with Medicare that it's been dispensed. So it's all a very regulated process. It's not a matter of receiving something in the mail or, you know, um, you know, the, the, and so the, I guess that's where um, like some of those testosterone clinics out there where you can, send through your blood work and if you've got low test um, they can send something out through the mail so are you saying that uh they may be unscrupulous and and sort of underground and and you're not yeah. actually getting uh what you think you are and also they they're not legal well look it's it's gray gray area legal so um i mean like you can you can look in sort of um uh HCCC, like Healthcare Complaints Commission, you could look at APRA, you could look at the Victorian Civil Tribunal, you could look at Queensland Civil Tribunals, and you can find probably in the last sort of 15 years or more, um, you can find probably half a dozen to a dozen cases of GPs or plastic surgeons or um, cosmetic surgeons who have prescribed testosterone to a patient that doesn't necessarily meet this very specific guidelines and they have been had sanctions placed on their practice because this does happen and it's essentially because it's not necessarily specifically illegal for you to go to a testosterone clinic i mean there, there is illegal aspects of it meaning something like for instance advertising on social media that's patently illegal patently illegal. you only have to look at the uh red cliff dolphins major sponsor that was dropped mid this year to see what happens when you're advertising a schedule 4d drug in plain sight for everybody to see we have very strict advertising code for um for drugs in australia you only have to see that and then then you can sort of extrapolate yourself you can join the dots that that's the term that people use um but in terms of you, a GP prescribing a, um, a a testosterone replacement. What seems to be the trend, in which I did observe a handful of times in practice, and I, as the outside anonymous observer of these cults, that's what I'll call them, um, you'll see that uh, some people are receiving prescriptions. Now, receiving or like having a prescription written, um, having the physical prescription in your hand and filling it at a nominated pharmacy. So that's the clinic saying you have to go to this pharmacy to fill it. That to me sort of, sort of raises a red flag. I, um, if, if I was a pharmacist at a, at a, in 2024, if I was a pharmacist in a community pharmacy and someone presented a private prescription for testosterone, that was just say 250 milligram of primatestin per week. I wouldn't even have primatestin in my dispensary. I'd have to order it in because it's not ever used. We keep drugs that are listed on the PBS in the um, in the dispensary. We don't go and take things that are seldom prescribed, like it's just a waste of money and like it just sit on the shelf and go out of expiry if we don't use it. That's the reason why we wouldn't. If I did that, I'd probably ring the prescribing physician, confirm that this is the patient, confirm what it is. Then I might ring Pharmaceutical Defense Limited, which is my insurance, and say, I'm a little bit skeptical about this. What, what should I do? Um, and then if they say, don't do it, I'd give it back to the patient, um, just to, just to cover my basis. Um, so that seems to be like, I can't be sure. Cause I've got absolutely zero involvement. That seems to be how some of them are operating and some other ones are operating saying that it's, you're going to receive something in the mail. So you, you go and do a, a telehealth clinic, a telehealth consultation with somebody. And that consultation might not necessarily even be with a doctor, like a GP, you know, like it's. You, you, you have, you, you're not even confirming their registration, their, um, you know, their qualification to be able to give you any sort of vetted advice through a re re recognised healthcare practitioner role. You're you're taking their advice and then you're you're sending them your blood work in the mail and they go, yeah, tick tick tick, you're good, yeah, sweet. Um, then. You, yeah, we'll write you a prescription. You don't ever see that prescription. Then all of a sudden you've got a compounded 
testosterone in the mail. Like they've, they've given you that and then they've given you some syringes and stuff like no, no nurse clinic to go and learn how to administer it yourself. If that's what you're doing. Cause like realistically, like that's a, as we've gone over, that's a risk in itself. Um, or a cream or, you know, something that's come from a compounded pharmacy. So, you know, like it's, uh, it's, it's, this is, this is what I've observed. Like, I don't know if it's reality or not. Like, I don't know. Cause as I said, I'm, I'm just observing. I'm, I'm completely, completely uh, detached from any involvement in it, but um, that's what it seems like. And look, if that's what it is and anybody who's listening now is involved in that and, or has become a patient or whatever it is, I'd just be extremely skeptical if what I'm saying to you is ringing any bells. Uh, be extremely skeptical and and maybe just wary. Um, I don't know. There's if you have a look, as I said before, um, you can see cases of where this has occurred, like you know, through tribunal transcriptions or whatever. You can also find media cases, like where it's been made media, and there's been cases in your state, Luke, where um, where uh, people have uh, have been running these clinics and they're 100% unscrupulous. There's no doctors. There's people masquerading as doctors who aren't doctors and they're prescribing anabolic steroids that are not on the ARTG, not on the Australian Register of Therapeutic Goods. So we're talking things like methanolone or um, bombinone, writing prescriptions for those that have never been on the ARTG register. So they've never been a medicine available to be prescribed. So like that, that in itself is madness. Absolute madness. Uh, it's so, a very, it sounds very dodgy and it, it doesn't seem like there's a clear pathway uh, moving forward. Like you said, there's a lot of regulations and things like that. So look, what, what would be some general advice if, if you're someone who, you know, maybe you're in your forties and you've got symptoms of low testosterone. Maybe you're you're feeling low energy, libido's low. Maybe not feeling yourself, bit of depression, or or maybe say you're a, you're a young fella and you've run a cycle of um, anabolic steroids and then you've come off and your testosterone's crashed. What can you do within um, the bounds of the law that actually is going to result in any potential boost in your natural testosterone levels? Is it is it like a terminal sort of decision? I'm going to run anabolic steroids or I'm going to run. Uh, testosterone replacement therapy and i've just got to do that forever because if i stop you know we've spoken about that negative feedback loop with the hpta what you know what would your advice be then um i would first go to your primary care physician whether that's your, your gp or whomever it is and then um and obviously assess like you know everybody's symptomatic presentation of what might inevitably be a testosterone deficiency might be different. So all those things you listed, the low mood, the low libido, uh, poor quality erections, um, you know, uh, bone mineral density, things like that. Um, they're, they're all sort of relatively subjective slash objective um, measures of things that could potentially be androgen deficiency. So the, the, the thing, the thing with, testosterone deficiency is ascertaining whether it is a pathological or a functional thing now that's not just to meet criteria to be prescribed it that's also as i mentioned before to tick off and to run through the differential diagnoses of different things it could be that might you know be potentially problematic should you continue doing whatever you're doing or not continue doing whatever you're doing without it. Can you just um, just simplify that a bit like pathological and, and functional? Just could you break that down on yeah. another level just what you mean by those two categories? Yeah, definitely. So the functional the functional uh, one, as I mentioned before, would be functionally that you you have uh, you have the capacity to produce testosterone normally, but it's perturbed meaning it's influenced by something else that's going on could be one thing could be a number of different things so, so like maybe before, sleep or stress or yeah, yeah, um, yeah. not exercising like, yeah, obesity. things like yep yeah, uh, obesity is a, a really a really um sort of prominent one um for males so like you're, you're overweight we, we spoke through the the mechanisms that that are at play there so that that's that's a functional one so um you know and yeah as mentioned there was also the drugs involvement in that so not only the steroids there's also opioids or corticosteroids or there's uh, even some um antidepressants can can um, influence luteinizing hormone pulsing uh pulsatile frequency so there's 
there's a few different things. So they're, they're all functional things. So they're all the things that are modifiable um, and they don't necessarily need to be modifiable pharmacologically. So um, meaning that they don't need a drug or a surgical intervention to, to do them. Then there's the pathological pathology, meaning disease. So that's, you know, things like congenital disorders, like genetic disorders, like Kalman syndrome or Kleinfelter syndrome. They're, they're, I mean, if you had those, you know, you got those because you probably wouldn't have gone through puberty, but they're, and then there's other things like your um, prolactinomas. So they're like uh, pituitary tumors, um, you know, uh, uh, orchectomy. So that's like losing your, your testicles. There's uh, types of things that are caused the testosterone uh, deficiency is caused by a disease itself. So the, and, the, and one manifestation sure. of that disease is low testosterone. Yeah. So and you, want, you would you want probably to know that, wouldn't you? Like you said, like growing up, maybe you've got a condition or maybe something's diagnosed, like you'd probably be quite aware of those. Oh, but I guess there, there's some that you're not. So um, so if you had a okay. pituitary tumor, for instance, that, that can develop at any time, a pituitary tumor. And some of the pituitary tumors are quite aggressive insofar as they'll they'll appear, then they'll grow big quickly and become problematic quickly. And some of them require like a complete removal of like parts of your pituitary or all of your pituitary yeah. and then total hormone replacement. Right? Like I, I, I know somebody who, who developed, who had had the early signs of that and then, but wasn't sort of picked up, just sort of had hormonal abnormalities sort of through his twenties and his thirties was picked up and, and he had to go on total hormonal replacement. Um, and so that's, that's testosterone, cortisol, thyroid hormone like he was totally every trophic hormone or every gland that has secretes a hormone as a result of what the pituitary does to it he had to replace all of those hormones and that's it's, sure. like it's pretty rare but at the same time it's like if you if you start taking testosterone as a result of having that disorder like he was a like i can speak personally about him he was seemed like a healthy dude seemed like a happy dude he had children, you know, um, you know, so there's, um, there's, you know, in terms of his presentation, it was probably, it was probably atypical, but at the same time, he, had he not, had he gone to a, you know, gone to his GP and found he had low testosterone without having any other markers tested, without having any CT scans or MRIs performed to ascertain that he had this disorder, this disease, then he might've gone and to one of these TRT clinics that, allegedly you know uh, very uh, you know frivolous in their dispensing uh, and, and and supplying um and he might have been put on that and this thing might have just been floating in the background and then as a result of that he might develop diabetes as a result of the um sure. to syndrome that he will eventually develop would so, you say would you say but that i guess for like most people watching this channel that they would potentially be looking at the functional causes of low testosterone so all the ones that you mentioned before um like you know yeah. maybe running PDs, maybe sleep stress um being overweight things like that would you say they're they're the more common ones and if they're if you do address common. some of those underlying uh let's say concerns what what are the chances that your testosterone levels come back is it quite like strong in the sense that like say i'm very stressed, but but all of a sudden now I'm getting more sleep. Maybe I, I'm practicing some mindfulness. Maybe I'm getting some counseling. Maybe my nutrition was all over the place, ultra processed foods and drinking alcohol. And so if you make some lifestyle modifications, does that actually really help? Because I, I know a lot of people out there might be a bit skeptical saying, well, there's no way I can bring up my testosterone doing all that. I mean, like we got to be realistic with what you're going to be bringing it up to. You know what I mean? Like, so, so one's basal levels is not necessarily a single target range. You know what I mean? So we have to be sort of realistic with that. But, um, you know, mentioning every one of those things that you did, like all of those things tend to be sort of self-perpetuating. So, you know, like you, you, your, your poor sleep will lead into stress. Your stress will lead into poor diet. You know what I mean? So they're all sort of, um, they're all sort of co-integrated yeah. to a degree. So, um, you know, and even if it isn't, like if, even if it isn't the, the testosterone concentration that reflects those symptoms, those symptoms could be reflective. The testo low testosterone symptoms could be reflective of that. You know what I mean? So, so what I'm trying yeah. to say is that yeah. even you, you could have a testosterone range of 25 nanomole per liter and have 
a bad libido and yeah. poor erections, but you could have all those lifestyle factors in there that are causing that. And inversely, you could have a low testosterone, have all those lifestyle factors that are affecting that. And it might not necessarily be the testosterone, but all the low testosterone symptoms um, get alleviated or somewhat alleviated by addressing those things. So, um, yep. yeah, we, sure. we're, we're talking, we're, we're, we're sort of re-perspectualizing what a testosterone concentration means in the scheme of what the symptoms are. Um, so yep. we can't really say with great certainty because all of those things are so commingled with so many other different things, we can't necessarily say that uh, the testosterone range is the cause of that. And that's what I find a lot of people tend to, you know, when you when you whack in your symptoms into Dr. Google and it spits out that, then that's going to be the panacea for you. And it might not. Yeah. And realistically, when you when you have a look at all like the, the clinical trial data, there's there's a vast spectrum of responses to it. So um, in terms of like those subjective assessments are so the things that, you know, are very unique to the individual. The, the, the responses to those, they, they can be good, they can be neutral. So, like, it's, yeah, it's... it's so, I guess there's you know, your, your testosterone levels, there's your lifestyle factors, and then there's the, your actual symptoms, and it's the combination of, of the three, like, the, the, yeah. it, there's an interplay. Yeah, 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 definitely. Yeah. And, and so, I guess, um, one thing we haven't mentioned then, is there any supplement out there that's going to boost testosterone naturally? I mean, you hear a lot about, you know, uh, say, zinc and... Uh, vitamin D, and I know there's, you know, gosh, going back 15, 20 years, I was taking the most disgusting tribulus powder out there. It, it doesn't seem like there's anything that's going to like really naturally boost your testosterone, but if you have some deficiencies, it may have an effect, like if you don't have enough mm. vitamin D or zinc. Is that right? Would that be a, a good way to describe yeah. it? Like there's no, there's no magic pill out there that's a natural supplement that's just going to boost testosterone. Yeah, yeah, you're probably right. You're probably right on that. Um, the, the trouble with um, the trouble with um, sort of assessing herbal supplements in particular, nutritional supplements are a little bit more uh, grounded in sound research, sound comprehensive research, because we develop nutritional guidelines, so we can we can ascertain um, we can ascertain uh, you know uh, the amounts that our body needs, you know, our recommended dietary intakes and allowances and things like that. So when there's de frank deficiencies, then it's um, it's a lot easier to be able to correlate those with specific symptomology. So so that's where it becomes a little bit more frank with 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 herbals and sort of exotic type uh, nutraceuticals. I believe that's the the terminology used now. Um, it's it's a little bit more grey and. Um, it, basically because the quality of the research as a result of not necessarily receiving the types of funding that what would be sort of standardized for a pharmaceutical is, um, is, is it's just not there. So something like, like for instance, like Tonkat Ali has got, um, which is a, an Indonesian plant, um, uh, Southeast Asian plant. I think it grows in the Philippines too. Um, it, uh, it has some, some evidence that it can, uh, you know, increase serum testosterone as a result of increased DHEA, I believe. I can't remember specifically, but um, but it's also you know that that's that's sort of one or two studies. So we can take those. And then recently, I was just reading a um, proceedings of the ISSN, and there was a study in there that basically used a pretty well controlled placebo control of Tonkat Ali using a standardized extract of a patented form that had previously demonstrated relatively reliable small increase in testosterone in hypogonadal, so low testosterone males. Um, and it didn't replicate the results. So like, you know, it's, it's, that's where I'm going with in terms of the reliability and the, um, and the quality of the evidence. So um, in short, um, you're right. Um, it's, you know, a zinc deficiency might, might reduce testosterone production. There's other vitamins like vitamin D. Yeah. Uh, uh, it could be, but like to, to get to frank deficiency levels that in a healthy person who has a healthy diet, which probably most of the people who watch your channel fit into that sort of demographic, um, a nutritional deficiency for testosterone uh, probably is very, very unlikely. So taking more of a nutrient um, will we'll do that. So the in terms of like, yeah, as I mentioned, with the, the uh, nutrient deficiencies, there's, there's seldom going to be 
anything that of any particular um, concern in a healthy population that's going to affect testosterone to the point of putting you into a frank deficiency. And in terms of herbals, um, I'm not convinced by anything thus far, like in terms of like what's what's out there, um, that you can reliably take it in a hypogonadal state and bring up your natural testosterone production. Um, it's there just hasn't been enough replication. So all the things that seem promising, they're still sort of in in a sense experimental, where um, where you know it's we're, we're kind of extrapolating either from animal research or we're extrapolating out uh, where we haven't necessarily uh, you know um, attended to all the different variables that can occur in the specific cohort or the cohort size. You know, in it, basically gauging it against what would normally be a standardization for a pharmaceutical it's it's we're probably never going to get there i mean there is some herbals that you know for other types of different things like st john's wort for depression that's that's uh relatively um relatively well established and um and, and you know like we can we could probably fit that into legitimately into a therapeutic guideline of treatment um for, for depression but um but yeah where, where we are now we're in any herbals um for for uh testosterone Increased testosterone production in um, uh, hypogonadal. That and disgusting and tribulus powder that I was drinking was a waste of time. I knew it. I knew it at the time. I was, I was going off the taste alone. <laughs> yeah, really mate. Was. Yeah. Uh, mate. And yeah. uh, one final question, Ben Winter. We know big bad Benny boy. So uh, about DHT. So uh, if you can, we spoke about testosterone converting into uh, estrogen. Testosterone can also convert into the hormone is it right DHT, which is a very strong androgen and is responsible for a lot of the is it development of the secondary male sex characteristics. So uh, Ben's question was about DHT and the effects on the prostate. And if you have an enlarged prostate, um, I, I'm assuming it is in relation to testosterone replacement therapy. If you know you have some underlying prostate issues. Um, yeah. You got anything to say about that? Well, um, so uh, prostate health is, is we can sort of, categorize it into different disease states so you uh, broadly speaking um we, you've got something called benign prostatic hyperplasia bph which is a, in a sense a benign um, increased hypertrophy of the prostate which can then produce the symptoms of you know an enlarged prostate in the colloquial term and then you've also got like things like your um your testicular cancers which can come in various different forms uh, not testicular, uh, prostate cancers you come in various different forms. So, um, and they're, they're, they're two distinct, the way the DHT sort of influences those two, um, well, more than two, it's one BPH and then probably seven or eight for the uh, prostate cancer is different. So they're different. In BPH, benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is probably the more common of the two diseases, although prostate cancer is one of the most common cancers in males. Um, BPH is, is probably more common than prostate cancer. Um, it is the, the hypertrophy of the prostate is androgen dependent. So insofar as it is treated either with what's called an alpha antagonist, alpha-1 antagonist drug, so that works on the alpha-1 receptors, which are involved in blood pressure regulation and also uh, microcapillary regulation of, of in terms of like blood flow and they will they can sometimes use um a five alpha reductase inhibitor too so the uh like uh, an asteroid is that one of them I know from hair loss. Yeah. yep yeah yeah so finasteroid um, at five milligrams tends to be used for um bph for one to five milligrams tend to be used for bph uh, five milligrams per day one milligram or below sometimes uh, either daily or sometimes tw uh, once uh, every second day or or bi-weekly um is used for for hair loss so th those drugs basically inhibit the local conversion of testosterone to um to, to dihydrotestosterone so that conversion occurring at the prostate level is implicated in the enlargement of the prostate. So if you are to inhibit, that's why they work in that condition. So whether the DHT is uh, the problem, the, 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 the effector molecule that's causing the enlargement of the prostate, or whether it is just 
one piece in the puzzle, inhib- by targeting that as your molecular target for the drug, um, you reduce the enlargement of the prostate in, in that condition. So, um, so if we're for, for Ben's sake, if, if it is BPH, if Ben has a not prostate cancer or, or it's for somebody else he knows or he just wants to know for his own interest, um, uh, the, the implication is that dihydrotestosterone acts in the prostate, which is another one of those endocrine glands. So when I spoke about the testosterone distributing to the muscles and to the endocrine glands, for the prostate is, is one of those endocrine glands that's very rich in expression of 5-alpha reductase, the enzyme that converts testosterone to, to, um, to dihydrotestosterone. And it's very rich in type 2, type 2 isoform DHT and type 1 isoform DHT, but more in type 2. And as a result of that, a lot of testosterone that reaches the prostate will be converted to DHT. So, so in essence, it's DHT and BPH uh, inter- interlinked, whereby inhibiting the production of DHT at the prostate will reduce the hypertrophy, the enlargement of the prostate, and thereby offset symptoms such as like difficulty voiding or incomplete voiding of bladder and um, pain and, and that type of thing. So if, yeah. if you were uh, running that uh, one of those medicines and you were on testosterone replacement therapy, would, would, is that like is that indicated like that um it's it's not like well now you've got prostate issues you shouldn't be on testosterone therapy at all well that's that's another one of those screening things that um that that would normally be run through um it's 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 not a frank um a frank uh uh contraindication it is for prostate cancer because there's some prostate cancers that aren't androgen dependent meaning that they require androgens to be able to proliferate replicate but there's quite a number that are so um so when when you have prostate cancer you might be put on something called an androgen deprivation therapy where they quite literally reduce your testosterone to the lowest levels possible that's through the uh, hormones that mimic luteinizing hormones so your body literally shuts down your pituitary and shuts down the testicles as well and and hormones that uh, mimic gonadotrophin releasing hormone that shut down the pituitary from the uh, hypothalamus so it's like complete shutdown and yep. they do that so that they can arrest the the prostate cancer in whatever sort of state it's at and then they can blast it with chemotherapy that is a frank deficiency a uh, frank contraindication for, for for testosterone replacement bph might might be like more of a thing that you'd monitor and it's yep. and it's uh, if it does occur during the uh initiation or duration of initiating testosterone replacement it might be something that might be up to the clinician's discretion whether they pull that out or not um it might be something that they treat concomitantly as it as it appears like so they might put you on something like tamsulosin which is a um an alpha one antagonist um uh, as i mentioned before and they might put you on something like um jutasteride or finasteride as a as a five alpha reductase inhibitor and then monitor from there but it's um it's uh, it's really up to the, the discretion of the um of the clinician. So they 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 tend to be your alpha one antagonists are your first line therapy, and uh, then your uh, five alpha reductase inhibitors are the second line. So, you know how that fits in the sphere of testosterone replacement is is would be managed by a urologist. It wouldn't even be something, even just the prescription of the tamsulosin might not necessarily be initiated by uh, your GP. Might be under the management okay. of urologist. Okay. So that, that just gives yep. you an indication as to how it's regulated in even more like yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah. No, thank you. Well, look, uh, thanks for your time, Nick. I'm going to put a time stamp on this now where I'm going to put a bit of a summary for everybody. So, man, I'm going to do my best. There's a bit here. And look, feel free yep. to interject. I'm just going to just go top level of everything we spoke about. So uh, essentially testosterone, a very important uh, male sex hormone. It's, it's present in females too, very small amount. Um, it essentially drives a lot of change in the body, especially for males going through uh, puberty. It, it has effects when it comes to uh, increasing lean muscle mass, numerous different pathways that you spoke about, potentially increasing muscle protein synthesis, uh, satellite cell activation. Um, there is uh, some other pathways where it might affect neural drive and affect your, your strength um, and what you can lift in the gym. Part of that too, I, we didn't really touch on, but um, some of that might come about from 
your mood and motivation too. Like if you have higher testosterone levels, like within natural ranges, you might be more driven to really drive and, and push in the gym and that might have an effect on your ability to lift as well. Um, the HPTA, so the hypothalamic pituitary testicular axis, it's a big negative feedback loop, um, two parts of the brain basically signaling each other and then there's a downstream effect on the testes which produces testosterone. Um, and is it the hypothalamus um, detects high testosterone levels? It also can detect estrogen. Both of those can potentially have uh, negative feedback, which can inhibit testosterone production further if they get too high. Um, and taking exogenous testosterone can really shut down the HPTA or they can have negative effects on it. Um, and if you're looking for uh, getting a prescription in Australia, at least for testosterone replacement therapy, there's very a very stringent process you need to go through. It can be very difficult. And if you're seeing ads on social media come up for testosterone replacement uh, clinics in Australia, be very wary. They're potentially uh, unscrupulous actors and they're underground and you might not know what you're actually getting in the mail. Um, and, and so your recommendation for anyone who believes they have low testosterone is to go to their GP first and foremost. Uh, and there's potentially a number of different lifestyle factors that you could look to to potentially uh, improve your overall testosterone production. But there's no there's no uh, magic sort of um, you know bullet that's just going to completely boost testosterone. But things like getting enough sleep, managing your overall stress levels, um, having a, a, a body composition where you're not too overweight, um, avoiding alcohol, things like this can all contribute to a healthier lifestyle, which can potentially see that your natural testosterone levels um, are not affected as such. And finally, when it comes to something like, uh, you know, DHT and the prostate and things like that, again, your, your number one piece of advice is to go to your GP and speak to your GP about these things. Don't necessarily speak to someone down the gym and, and be wary of these uh, online testosterone clinics that send out stuff overnight just based on some simple blood work. It was perfect. Absolutely perfect. <laughs> well, Nick, look, thank you very much for coming on, mate. I'd love to have you on again. I really do appreciate it. Um, I am going to put the timestamps on this so people can flick around, and I do appreciate your time, mate. So thank you very much. Uh, always welcome, mate. Thank you. No worries.